Hundreds of thousands of words have been written about Andy Warhol. I added a few of my own writing factory made. Warhol's circle of friends didn't write many letters or journals, so I went to their homes and interviewed them, sometimes over and over. I developed a strategy where members of the Silver Factory watched one another on video and responded. I call it talkback. Andy remains a mystery, but these close friends provide clues. You can compare him to other people, you can describe his style and his attitude, but he was all that stuff t together as a living thing. And I think it's, it's interesting that Andy looks like he's going to be famous forever. And it's, in a sense, it's too bad that the people didn't, aren't able to really experience him in that first decade, because that was the his genius just flowing out all over the place, you know? And it was before he became dependent on people to run other things. And it was when he, everything he did, he had to do himself in his own way. So uh, people can never know that about Andy. They can know about his art. Andy is <laughs> such a paradox because he was full and he was empty. He was the sweetest and he was the meanest. And he was the most talented and the least of them. And he was the total idiot, the village idiot, and the genius of New York, the lord of New York. You know, he, he was all of that. So I guess that's why we're still talking about him and trying to figure him out. And um, I think he was a true alien, actually. He was like a blind person who develops these other senses to an extraordinary level. He could hear what other people could not hear. He could see what other people could not see. And then he thought what other people did not think. Who could take the Empire State Building and film it for 12 hours and make something profound out of it? A sense of wakeness, you mean? A high pitch of wakeness, which is what you might call, you know, what we call that, that, that intense consciousness that certain people have about the world, which is the thing that I most admire in people and where our only actually our rapport resided between me and Andy because we had very little else in common. I have written and, and said many times that of course he's an uh, uh, Warhol an incredible genius. The genius is entrepreneur, right? And is instinctual iconoclast and is the father of deconstructionism. He gave license, permission, and from him there wouldn't be a Wegman, there wouldn't be Nam June Paik. You know, he was really our genius. What the populace doesn't give Andy credit for is all that, um, is the genius, it, there's a social, he's a social psychologist and, and anthropologist. And, and, and when you read the philosophy A to Z and Winter Warhol, you understand how brilliant yeah. he is. Yes. But yes. nobody who knows him most people who worked with him and know him don't even know that. He understood iconography. If he didn't understand it intellectually, he sure understood it on a, you know, that if you repeat anything enough, like they are on television right now, uh, it becomes a fact, mm -hmm. or it becomes a, you know. An iconic fact, yeah. Those pictures of the World Trade building falling down over and over and over and over again. It was pure Warhol. I thought this guy has turned the spotlight from this commercial advertising total American sell, sell or else. He's turned the spotlight right back on them with this hanging this painting of a soup can, which it didn't change an iota of it and saying, this will cost you a couple thousand. Look at this. What you can buy in the store for 50 cents is costing you thousands. And the rich loved it. I thought it was a brilliant satirical takeoff on the United States. 
and I loved it, and it fitted in with the whole beat idea of defying everything. It was one of the most subtle moves possible. Well, I thought it was just so vacuous in a way. I didn't think it was. I didn't even think it was going anywhere. Who would ever have dreamt that to be so, anyone could be so famous for silk screening, off-registered Liz Taylors on canvas? You know, that's when, when uh, sometimes someone would say, did you ever dream he was going to be so famous? My answer is no, none of us said ever did. At least none of us, uh, uh, the pre-pop people ever thought of it. Well, in fact, Andy didn't do anything, and that was his main thing. He did not restrict us in any way. He didn't ever give us any, you know, direction in any of the movies. He, uh, he didn't, you know, the only thing he would do was mildly complain, um, which he did all the time. I mean, oh, no, no, I don't. But then if you really, if you listen to his complaints, it was like he was always, you know, like, everybody thinks this is really pretty. Don't you think this is pretty, Andy? No, 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 I like it the other way. But nobody likes it that way, Andy, but I do. He was always picking the opposite, constantly throwing everything into whack like this. Which brings me to the chaos thing. I mean, he understood chaos, he created it, and in chaos you can do whatever you like. You don't have any rules. And so it's the most creative atmosphere you can have. Like Mary said, it's so, it's so accurate that the sense of chaos, we were on the edge all the time, which did have to do with Andy's need for creativity in in a situation like that. But it, it also had to do with all the people who were coming were characters and were essentially geniuses and needed that type of intensity also. And it's like we were always living on the, on the uh, what, is, what is the event horizon, you know, and we were gonna fall in the hole at any moment, but I would always be there just to stop you from falling into the hole and that you could here sit on the sofa and have a fun. I think there's some people who, who work best in solitude and other people draw energy from people around them. And I can't help but think that Andy is one of the latter. He could have closed the door to the factory and that he in continually allowed people to come in while he was working and in fact drew them into what he was doing uh, makes me very, think very clearly that this is uh, if not consciously, then at least unconsciously, what his intention was. He was a, a Zen priest who sat in the middle of a huge Zen garden or a puzzle or a maze, a attracting a certain type of personality. And you had to get in. He wasn't going to help you. He just looked at you and talked at you. And you looked at his work and then you entered the maze. But he would also tell you once you were close to him, and I think I was close to him at least for a very short time, you got in, you get out. I'm not going to help you. I realized that Andy was a natural yogi because the, the point of those guys is you get power by emptying yourself. If you empty yourself completely, then naturally things flow into you. And I, I realized that's what Andy knew instinctively. When he was directing a film, it was insane. He wouldn't say anything. And yet, that very vacuum of his not doing anything and constantly retreating made everybody come after him made, and made people act who had never acted before because they were trying to get to him. And then all of a sudden their voice came out and all of a sudden they were doing things. And it's because he retreated, instead of barking orders and telling him what to do, he would retreat backwards. You wouldn't hear a word from him. He wouldn't say anything. So it was interesting. That's very interesting.